Welcome to our talk on uh, metrics-driven blue-green deployment using Spinnaker's cloud front integration. I'm Amit Nambiar, and this is... Hi guys, my name is Pasa Pachala. We're um, platform architects out of Australia, so not far from Philadelphia, but yeah. <laughs> um, so we're glad to be here. Thanks for coming. Great. Yep, it's been... Uh, this is probably going to be the most challenging talk of my career. You know why? I was here one hour earlier and just got the thing working, the presentation. My laptop died. Just imagine what I'm going to do. I don't have access to GitHub, but hopefully we'll get through this one. Uh, yeah, our focus is going to be on Cloud Foundry integration for Spinnaker. Pass will be talking about how the different abstractions built into Spinnaker connect to uh, Cloud Foundry application runtime, right? How do they map to these operations in Cloud Foundry? I'll be doing an end-to-end -end demo of uh, a pipeline using Canary Analysis to deploy apps onto Cloud Foundry at the end. Right. So Spinnaker is a continuous delivery platform uh, which, has, which has its origins at Netflix, right? Uh, can we have a quick show of hands on how many of you have heard about or worked with Spinnaker before? That's great. Maybe we should get them to come up. Yeah. <laughs> the CF integrations for Spinnaker has some great uh, features added recently. And I hope this talk will take you through those features and you know, get you excited enough to start using them. It's a great addition to the Cloud Foundry platform to have this integration. This is a great book uh, from Netflix about continuous delivery with Spinnaker. It talks about the intent, the problems of uh, doing continuous delivery at scale. Uh, and this quote actually caught my attention. It says, we defined a paved road that encapsulates best practices for teams wishing to deploy to the cloud, right? That's exactly what Spinnaker provides. It provides a paved road for you to start with your continuous delivery uh, process, right? So I just wanted to draw an analogy to uh, the Cloud Foundry application runtime, which in my opinion also provides a paved road for enterprises to run all your apps, right? So what I'm trying to say here is the CF integration for Spinnaker is, is what, it, what it's doing is bringing together the best of both worlds for you. And I think the Cloud Foundry community is going to benefit greatly from this integration. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Paz, who's going to talk to you about the uh, how Spinnaker and Cloud Foundry, how these uh, mappings work. So guys, I'll start with this slide. I actually stole this from the um, Spinnaker team, but I like it because it says Spinnaker is a multi-cloud delivery platform. And what that means is, is that Spinnaker is going to manage these resources on your behalf on ISs such as GCP, Azure, AWS, for example. But it also does it on platform as a service with App Engine. And we're going to be focusing on what it does with Cloud Foundry in this talk as well, as well as container orchestration systems such as Kubernetes as well. But what I wanted to bring up here is if you think the cloud provider interface for Cloud Foundry, so you've got Bosch that has a clean separation between the actual clouds that it's talking to through the cloud provider interface, it's a similar concept with, with Spinnaker. There's a separation and there's accounts that you configure to be able to talk to the clouds themselves. So how is it actually added? Um, if you speak to the Spinnaker team and you tell them that you've got Spinnaker installed and you don't have HAL, they'll probably tell you that it's not supported. So that's a critical part to Spinnaker. You can install Spinnaker without HAL, but HAL is the actual command line administration tool for Spinnaker itself. And it's the way we actually add a Cloud Foundry provider is using HAL. Now, I say here greater than 1.15, but anyone that's on latest versions of Spinnaker will know that HAL is actually at 1.18 now and 1.19 coming out soon. But you actually just enable the Cloud Foundry provider like that, and you actually then go and add a Cloud Foundry account. There's really only three pieces of information that's really important. This is the same as when you're using the Cloud Foundry CLI. That's the API endpoint for your Cloud Foundry instance, the user and password. The environment can be also added, but not necessary. Now, if you're using a pivotal Cloud Foundry instance, a commercial version of Cloud Foundry itself, Apps Manager URI and Metrics URI gives us more capability within Spinnaker to be able to reach out to Apps Manager and Metrics of your apps at the appropriate time. So what does this mean for Spinnaker? Once I've added 
Cloud Foundry, what are some of the things that I can do? So we've got here the ability to do manifest-based deployments. That's obviously quite important because all you see if pushes are more than likely going to be using a manifest. Blue-green deployments, multi-foundation view of applications. This one's quite important because I can add multiple Cloud Foundry accounts to Spinnaker. I'm not tied to just one. So I can see all my applications across all my foundations. You'll, as you'd expect, application management actions, all these ability to, be able to enable, disable, destroy, all these actual terms that I'm referring to are Spinnaker terms. They actually map back to Cloud Foundry. So for an example, enable and disable is actually a CF stop will disable the app. CF start will actually enable the app. So Spinnakers make those calls on your behalf. So sometimes when you're first working with Spinnaker and Cloud Foundry, you may find that the terms kind of, what does this actually mean? But they're actually mapping to what you're doing with the CFCLI. Recently, they added the ability to actually deploy services as well. So it will actually reach into the marketplace of Cloud Foundry, display those services, and allow you to create stages in your pipeline that create services as well which is quite neat. And then obviously as creating a server group when we do a deployment itself, we can actually bind to those services that have been created. I'm actually gonna show you live on the pipeline what that may look like. And so once you've enabled Cloud Foundry, you'll get your little cloud provider down the bottom there and you'll be able to select Cloud Foundry when you create a new application. Okay, so resource mapping. An account in Spinnaker is referred to as a Cloud Foundry user account. That's exactly what that is, a login to Cloud Foundry. It's not an org, it's not a space. The Cloud Foundry integration will actually go use the permissions that it's got from the Cloud Foundry account user that you've got and traverse everything and pull those applications into Spinnaker for you. The load balancer is actually the Cloud Foundry route. There, are, there is no load balancer that you create within Cloud Foundry, as you're all aware. The router itself has routes. So in Spinnaker terms, that's a CF route. Server group is probably the most important concept in Spinnaker with Cloud Foundry because that maps the deployment of a specific Cloud Foundry app to an actual foundation. At that point, it goes into an org in a space. And I'll show you that live as well. A region is the actual CF space mapping. And an instance, as you can imagine, is a single container instance of your app. So if you've got an application deployed on Cloud Foundry and you have 10 instances, Spinnaker will show those 10 instances as separate instances, exactly how it shows in Cloud Foundry. So there's also operation mapping, and I'll show you that live as well. So the ability to deploy, roll back, resize, we'll do a CF scale, for example, enable, disable, I've already spoken about those. Destroy, completely remove an application. You can do as well. Clone is another one that you can actually take an existing server group that you've had deployed and just clone that and use that as the base of what you're gonna do for your next deployment. Map load balancer and up map load balancers are quite new. That gives you the ability to add routes or remove routes from your application. And I'll show you that live in a pipeline that I've configured. And terminate an instance is actually go and kill the, that, that specific application instance, not the app, the instance that you want to terminate. And I'll show you in the UI how that looks like. So there's a couple of screenshots here down the bottom, but I'm going to show you live. So let's just do that. I think that's part of what we're doing next. So here's the sample pipeline that I'm going to show. This is not a real pipeline. I created a pipeline that will show some of the stages that map to Cloud Foundry that you could use in a pipeline if you're doing a continuous delivery or some sort of deployment to Cloud Foundry. So in my one here, I've used the deploy stage, the deploy service, disable server group, resize server group, and map load balancer. So I've used quite a few of the different stages that map to the Cloud Foundry stages themselves. And so if you look at the, when I do a deploy, this is actually a CF push, as you can imagine. When I select the stage resize server group, you can see there in this image, I get the ability to change the number of instances, maybe the memory, maybe the disk. I don't know why you'd ever change this, but anyway, it's there. And so as a result of that, I can make changes live within my pipeline as well. Um, I need to show this slide because I like this image. That's the only reason you see in this slide. Okay, so. Let's go to a demo. And why does everyone, when they have to do a demo, say that, you know, I hope the demo gods are with me? If it doesn't work, it's not the end of the world for you guys, but it might be the end of the world for me, right? So, so let me go to, we've got a couple of different tabs here. I believe this is my one. Okay, so if I go to, now remember I told you I added a Cloud Foundry account, and that account has gone and pulled in all the applications that I have access to, privileges, and then pulled them into Spinnaker here. And one of these here is this little application called CF here. 
I feel better. Because this means that my back end environment's working. So not smoke and mirrors. Okay, so let me start at some of the stuff that Spinnaker and some of those terms I spoke about, server groups, apps, instant instances, some of those commands that we can run. So let's have a look at this. If you have a look at this in the server group, we're going to start there. So is this big enough, by the way? How's that? A bit better? Cool. All right, so this is a Node.js app, something new to me. I've never demoed a Node app, ever. So I've been working with Pivotal for five years. So you might want to wonder, why would he demo a Node app? Why not Pivotal love Spring Boot, me included? The reason is when I start an instance in Node, let's be honest, it starts quick. If I start it in Java, yeah, just have to wait a bit longer. So in the server group here, I spoke about actions. So let's go and do one of those actions now. I'm going to actually resize. Now, in the real world, you probably, your administrators won't go in and manage Cloud Foundry this way and do resizes. Everything's done in the pipeline, so I'm going to go to pipeline sec. But what I do want to show is some of the features that are available. So I'm going to resize this. We'll make it one, for example, and hit submit. Now I'm going to go to here. This is definitely too small. How's that? So you can see now that this app, CF app, no, what is it? Oops. CD doesn't work in Cloud Foundry. CF does though. <laughs> and so you'll see now that it's actually gone from two instances to one instance, right? So what I'm going to do is, just while we're waiting for that to come up, show you some of the other actions that we can do. So we'll leave it at that versus changing it. Spinnaker's has given me a nice UI saying it was successful. So I remember I spoke about all these other commands. So you could destroy, for example, and completely take this Node.js out, out of Pivotal Cloud Foundry, or Cloud Foundry in this case. So I'm not going to do that, but there's other different server group actions as well, such as map and unmap load. I spoke already about clone. So here I could just add a new route to this application if I wanted to do it. So you can see how it ties in nicely with Cloud Foundry. Now, I spoke about actual application instances. Here's my last surviving instance. And so from here, I'll actually like to turn on with details. One of the things you can see here, that's big enough, is that actual ID there for the instance is actually the app width within Cloud Foundry. And then right at the end, there's a little zero, which is the index of the actual Cloud Foundry application index itself. So if I have more, I'll have one, two, and so on and so forth. So here I can actually look at the actual routes, if I can scroll down. And so there's the actual application if I wanted to go to that. I'm conscious of time, so I want to show you just a quick, we all know there's application running on Cloud Foundry, nothing new, thanks Pass. Okay, so if I go to a pipeline, Spinica demo, This is how you really use Spinnaker, obviously. So in the pipeline here, I've got this little boring pipeline, but what it does do is show some of the, how is that for size? So for example, here I'm deploying an application. And when I deploy an application, I define. The reason I'm going through this really quickly is Amit's going to do a proper pipeline, which is going to do a canary analysis. And so you'll see all that sort of stuff there. And he'll do it live, right? He'll, live, he'll, live, he'll show his demo of the pipeline live. What you'll see here is I'm using a HTTP artifact with many different type of artifacts within Spinnaker in terms of the deployment. This one's the most boring, but it's the most easiest, right? Because I just HTTP endpoint to a jar, for example, and I can just deploy it. But here you get, this is the form-based manifest entries that I can put in. Now, you get a fair bit here, such as the environment variables, the ability to bind to services, build packs, health check, not quite everything. The manifests within Cloud Foundry are quite exhaustive. So in that case, you could just select artifact here and actually change this to actually go and read a manifest somewhere else. Again, use a HTTP artifact. So I'm going to cancel that. So what else do we have here that I could show? So resize server group. Here's an example of at the end of deploying an application in my pipeline, I'm going to go from one instance to two instances, for example. Right? Run Maybe a manual test has been run and we're all good to go. And so all of these stages are actually manual state judgment is something within Spinnaker, but all of these stages such as deploy application, uh, resize server group, add route to production, all of these are some of the new, so map load balance, some of the new stuff that's come into Spinnaker around the Cloud Foundry integration. 
So with that, I believe I'm going to pass to a meter is going to show what you're really here for. And this is like how we do a canary analysis in Spinica for a cloud foundry up itself. So. Cool. Thanks, Baz. Thanks for the great introduction. <laughs> so I want every one of you to get a little bit creative. This app has been purpose built for this demo, but I'll explain the intent behind the app. So it's called time till pickup prediction service. When you book a cab or Uber, you'll see the time the driver would arrive at your place, right? When is he going to meet you? So that's, so imagine this as a backend service of a car or a cab hailing app, right? A bunch of microservices. One of them is this one, which is going to predict given a latitude, longitude, and where the customer is, how long is it going to take? And this has some very stringent uh, requirements, non-functional requirements that the request, a prediction request should finish in say 200 milliseconds, right? So why I'm building up this story is because I want to prove that, okay, with the canary analysis, the prediction time when it goes spikes up, it's going to fail and that change doesn't propagate into production. That's the whole idea I want to uh, show here, right? So let's go through the pickup prediction uh, service pipeline, right? This is what the developers are using right now to, uh, commit and, uh, and propagate the change into production. So developers push their code into the Git repository, in this case GitHub. We have set up a web hook to notify Jenkins about this change. Jenkins uh, picks up those artifacts, builds the app, and uploads it into GCS, that's the Google Cloud Storage. We have set up a subscription from there uh, for Google PubSub uh, to notify about that new upload into the bucket. Okay, I want to pause here and say, this notification is going into Spinnaker, but Spinnaker has a lot of integrations with Jenkins, Artifactory, and other things. The demo we are running right now is in a unique uh, environment. We are running it in a private lab which doesn't have outbound access, sorry, inbound access. So we have gone with this kind of a setup, which looks complicated, but it need not be this uh, complicated, right? So that notification comes in to Spinnaker, and Spinnaker realizes, okay, there is a new build available, and goes to Google Cloud Storage, picks up that build and starts uh, running the pipeline, which I'll be showing you in a, in a minute. But what it does is it deploys a baseline version, canary version, I'll explain what these mean in Spinnaker or in uh, 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 continuous delivery terms or continuous deployment terms. And then it's, then it's uh, calling Kanta. Kanta is an automated uh, canary analysis tool which is built into Spinnaker. I'm just showing it outside of Spinnaker here to make it clear that it is using Kanta to do the canary analysis, right? But Kanta needs some kind of a application monitoring kind of a tool. We have used Datadog in this case, It supports uh, think Prometheus, New Relic, and all those kinds which fall in that category, right? So once that's done, if the automated canary analysis passed, then the, what that means is it can go into production. Then Spinnaker deploys that app, into Pivotal Application Service uh, as part of this demo, which is, uh, which is based out of Cloud Foundry application runtime. So that's the flow which we are going to show. So just briefly, Kanta is a platform for automated canary analysis. Canaries were formerly used by miners to warn of dangerous gases in the mines. So it's, uh, you can try and relate this to putting a new version into production, right? You're taking it in there and seeing whether it is okay to run this uh, in a production environment. If it fails, you want to shut it down and come back as soon as possible, right? Canary release is a technique to reduce the risk from deploying a new version into software, into, into production, sorry. Okay, it has some information about how it is done. I have a beautiful slide on that, so I'll just quickly pass through this one. Right, I want to talk about this current situation we are in with this uh, uh, pickup prediction service. What has happened is uh, the developers introduced a deep learning algorithm <laughs> to, to predict time, right? And it has failed miserably because it has spiked. The amount of time it takes to respond to a request has gone from 200 milliseconds, 250 milliseconds to like 600 plus milliseconds. And that's how the canary has failed. This is the data dog metrics which for the actual failed uh, canary, right? Now let's look at the actual pipeline in Spinnaker.
Yep, as you can see, this is the last run, and that uh, the Datadog uh, graph which you saw was this failure here. So if you look into this canary analysis here, you can look at the canary summary there. That's the report of the failed canary analysis. You can see that uh, the top one is the canary, which is at 650 milliseconds, and the baseline is at 250. So what I'm going to do just for demonstration purposes is uh, change that algorithm to return sooner, right? I'm just, it's just using a thread dot sleep. I'm going to change that so that, you know, it just proves the point, right? So yeah, what has happened is I've lost my uh, credentials and everything to GitHub. I've somehow managed to get on the web thing. So I'm going to make a change here and commit these changes from here so that, you know. What, he, what he's saying is his laptop crashed 10 minutes before the yeah. yeah crash. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, not rebooted and we can come back, crashed, dead. Yep. That's so, what we say in Australia, right? Crashed. Oh, did they say something else here? I don't know. Every time I talk in, anywhere I go, I say something and it's not quite right. So. <laughs> All right. So what I'm going to do is, so, so this is, so what you see here, this is the time to pr uh, pick up prediction service, right? So all it's doing is just a delay. Just the, the, as I said, it's purpose built for this one. I'm going to change the delay to 200 to make it right, right? It, it was spiking. So I'm going to commit these changes. Okay, so I wanted to make another change, but can I do it at the same time? I cannot, so, okay. There is a UI for this as well. I'll show you the uh, current product, uh, this is the current, This is the current current pickup prediction service in production, right? It has a UI which is just uh, a car. So I what I wanted to do actually for the demo was change this color to green as well, just to indicate it's a blue green deploy. But I don't think I'll be able to commit both at the same time and get Jenkins to build it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure uh, the canary passes by uh, just making that change. Are you guys following what I'm saying here? Great, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to commit these changes, which is going to kick off the pipeline, right? So this change, as you can see, a build has started here, right? While this is happening, okay, what's going to happen is it's going to build the artifact and then upload it into Google Cloud Storage, then it gets notified into Spinnaker, right? While that's happening, you can see there are no builds happening at the moment here. In probably 30 seconds, you can see there's a pipeline, which is this one, which will kick off, right? I'll probably get started with this, go through the stages, uh, as you, and you will see the pipeline in action soon. So the first step is here, this is the configuration. Here, this is where I'm saying, okay, what is the trigger for this pipeline? As I said, it's a PubSub notification coming in from the Google PubSub uh, subsystem, right? So that's the trigger for this. What's the first step I'm going to do? I'm going to deploy a canary and a baseline, right? Let me just pause there and talk about canary analysis. I think this is the right time to introduce it. Okay, this is, this is what we are going to do, and this is the situation we are in right now, right? Uh, the tags. <laughs> okay, it was an older slide. Anyway, so this is production traffic coming in to uh, the CF router, and it, there are three instances of the app in production, right? So what's happening is all these instances, the production instances are sending metrics to Datadog right now. And we introduce a baseline version, which is an exact copy of production, but just start up one instance of it, right? What's the purpose of this, and why not use the production metrics, right? The idea is the best, the production system might have been running for say 24 hours or more, don't know, and it might have cached some data, it might, it might have done something which has improved its performance over time, right? We don't want it to compare with the new canary. What we want to do is how does the new version of the baseline, that's the production, compared to a new version of the canary? Are you guys following what I'm saying? So that's exactly what is being done here. One instance of the production version is uh, spun up, and that starts uh, sending metrics to Datadog. But we want to identify which one is production and which one is baseline. 
So that's why we are going to add tags to them. So the tag there for production is, it says deployment is production. For baseline, we are saying deployment is baseline. So Datadog collects these metrics. The next thing we do is the new version, which came from Google Cloud Storage, right? The new version of the uh, app. We're going to take that and send metrics with the tag of Canary. One thing you need to uh, note here is all the three uh, different apps, not three different apps, three different uh, versions, not even three different, two versions of the app are all bound to the same URL. Why is that? Because we want to send traffic to all three of them so that they generate metrics and then we can do an analysis on it, right? So in this case, when the first baseline was spun up, it's getting 25% of the tra traffic, and when the canary came up, it's again splitting between all these versions, right? So a small portion of the traffic is now going to uh, these instances. I imagine with the weighted routing, I think we can do some really interesting uh, traffic splitting between these uh, instances. But for now, I think it's just doing a round robin, right? So let's look at where the pipeline is. As I said, the pipeline has kicked off. And you can see the deploy canary and the deploy baseline is done, right? So let's have a look here. Previously when we looked, it was just the production version. Now you can see four versions, uh, sorry, there are three, three apps. Oh, it's not, sorry guys. And make the screen a bit bigger. You can see the two, uh, two new versions deployed in the last three minutes. The baseline and the canary has been spun up and uh, Datadog is getting those metrics. Let's look at Datadog. Yep. So the yellow line is the production version and since these two were just spun up now, that's why you see the metrics for the baseline and the canary. So I can just disable the canary. So what you're seeing is the baseline, right? Henry. What you need to note here is, you can see all of them are almost on the same line. That means, okay, the spike is gone, the base, uh, the canary version, that's the new version, is at 250 milliseconds now. So, what we can do next is, okay, I have, I have a stage called manual judgment here. The only reason, this goes completely against the continuous deployment practice where you don't have any manual intervention. The only reason I have this is I wanted to show you the metrics, show you that the app has spun up and stuff, that's all. So I can just say continue here, which will kick off the canary analysis and then make a decision with, about the canary result and deploy to production, delete the canary and then delete the baseline. So I'm going to say continue. Okay, let's look at what exactly is happening here and look at the configuration as well. So as you can see, there is a, you, you can set up uh, all these parameters. So I've said, for the purpose of this demo, I want a warm-up period of one minute. You could say whatever time you want it to wait. And the interval there, the second stage, which it's going to get to after one minute, is uh, what's the interval for the canary runs, right? That's one minute again. So it'll warm up for one minute, wait for the first minute, first minute interval, run the first canary analysis, wait for another one minute, run the second run. And then we can look at the reports, whether it's uh, passed or failed. If it fails on the first canary run, the entire pipeline stops, right? Let's look at what is the canary config, right? I mean, what exactly is this doing? So this is the canary configuration here. So the only metric I'm interested in is the pickup prediction time, right? If you look at what the configuration looks like, it's, it's just looking at Datadog for a prediction time prediction time that average, right? Uh, one of my colleagues within Pivotal mentioned when I was showing this demo to him that average is not a good statistical measure for doing such kind of things. You should look at percentiles and stuff. So it's just uh, for your information, I have not changed it in the demo. But yeah, that's something to keep in mind. Look at this one, the criticality fail, the canary if the metric fails. And also you can say fail on increase, right? Why would you fail a canary on decrease? If your performance is improving, there's no point in you know failing it, it's good for you. So only fail on increase. So that's some really cool features built in there. The other thing I wanted to show was the configuration of the canary analysis stage itself.
So here, this is where we are saying, okay, use this scanner config, which I sh just showed you, right? And this is the lifetime is two minutes, the delay is one, and the interval is one. You guys know that. Now, this is the important part. I'm saying, well, where is the baseline, right? When you look at data.org and when you send that query for the prediction time, this is the tag which you have to look for. I mean, all metrics associated with that tag. And for the canary, I'm using this one. Now, how does this happen? How do I change that? So if I look at the canary configuration here, I've set it here as an environment variable. When this particular version of the software is launched, this is the tag or this is the environment variable you need, need to use. And how, do, how did I map it? So if you go to this service here, this is, I'm using Micrometer. It's a Java based library for sending metrics to different kinds of APMs. Uh, I'm saying the prediction time, whenever this function is called, just log the time it took to run this function to Datadog, right? That's how everything comes together, basically. Yep, let's go back to the pipeline and see where it is. Yep, it's past the canary analysis. Let's look at what the results are there. So you can see the canary summary. The last one I showed, there was a failure, but let's look at what this one shows. As you can see, yeah, it has come down and they match now and that's how the canary analysis passed. And you can see the deviation is just 1.4 percentage. And there are some more information as to uh, how many uh, metrics were collected, how many runs were there, uh, what's the average between the baseline and the canary, and information like that, right? So the example I'm giving here is just for prediction time. You could go and say, log the, uh, log the CPU time used, log the memory on different metrics, right? System, system metrics can also be logged and uh, run as part of a canary analysis. So you can say all these metrics and you can, there are lots of options within this canary configuration where you can say, okay, if this metric fails, don't worry, let's go ahead. If the percentage of change is less than 20%, don't worry, go ahead with the thing. Okay, so that has passed. The last stage is deployed to production, right? Because now we know that the canary analysis has passed. The last stage is to deploy to production. So I just wanted to point out something here. You can use the spring expression language to actually uh, test what has happened in a particular stage. For example, here what I'm saying is check whether the canary analysis stage has succeeded, right? I'm using it here in deploy to production. I'm saying only if the canary analysis has passed, deploy to production. Otherwise, what's the point? You shouldn't be deploying it into production, right? And the other stages, the delete canary and delete baseline, irrespective of what has happened, whether the canary passed or failed, I want to get rid of it, right? So those don't have any such conditional statements. So I think uh, once the deploy to production task is done, you should see here the new version in production with the low la lower uh, latency. Yep. You can see that the production version is now four, and uh, the previous version which was in production has stopped. Now, this is another cool thing which you can do. Uh, if you're not sure, right, you want to keep the old version still there, uh, so that if you want to roll back, something's gone uh, majorly wrong, if you want to roll back, you can do that as well. The way you do that is, if you look at the configuration for deploy to production, Clicked on the wrong one. There are a few strategies here, right? What I've said is use a red-black kind of a deployment. What that means is till the new version of the software is up uh, and running, don't disable the other one. As soon as that comes up and the health check has passed, disable the previous one, but don't get rid of it. Keep it there, right? If I want to roll back, I want to roll back. The other one is called Highlander, which is the next strategy, which says just get rid of everything if the new version uh, passes the uh, canary analysis, right? I think... Uh, 
Yeah, one more thing, sorry, the last one I want to uh, point out is the spawning of the baseline, how do you do that, right? It's basically cloning this stage, whatever is in production, right? So it's a, it's a new feature which has been added uh, by the Cloud Foundry integration team within Pivotal. So what I'm seeing here is, clone, uh, the stage is called clone server group. You can have a, see here the clone server group. What it does is, what is a baseline? Basically it's a copy of production, right? So what we are saying here is, the source is, look at, look at this stage, sorry, look at this region, that is, look at the pickup prediction service organization and production space and pick up the newest server group and spin up a version for me. That's how you create a baseline here, right? Yep, I think uh, the pipeline is done, so I think it's a successful demo. I'm happy, even without my laptop, it got through. So <laughs> I think that's the end of our uh, talk, unless you have to no, mention okay. something, Baz. Cool, if there are any questions, I think uh, we're happy to take. Yeah, the disabled. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so the previous version of the software is version 13 and... Yeah. She's the uh, product manager for the Cloud Foundry integration. Spinning car. <laughs> Olga. And yeah, if there are any questions we are happy to take now. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The second one is imagine you're running a twenty fifteen app. Mm-hmm. Um decide that to go. Yep. Uh, as soon as you finish routing, will it spin up to the twenty pieces or are you going to underload beyond load at that point? Do you Sorry, see what I mean? Like, I so let's just say you're, you're spun up at 20 instances. Yep, because that's the production version. Load on, you have an enormous pressure on production, yep. but you only have one instance of the canary, right? Correct. So when you flip the routing, are you going to spin it up to 20 instances right away? Where are you flipping load? the routing? Um, from Spinnaker. I'm assuming that when you say the canary is good, you're going to go from 1.0 to 1.1. Yeah, the routing or, is still the same. Or are you just going to deploy 1.1 to the production instance? Yes, okay. it's, it's binding to the same route. Okay. Yeah, and disabling the previous one, that's all. Okay. So the deploy stage will deploy in the new version in 20 instances, make sure they're healthy, then flip the route to them and disable the, the old version. And then it deletes baseline and canary separately. So if you look it here... It will not reroute to canary. The new versions the to new 20, version, right. And call that production. Right. No, no, uh, the canary, you can control it, how many instances you want to spin up, right? If you look here in the uh, pipeline configuration for the canary, you can say how many instances do you want to spin up of the canary, right? But normally it's, if 20 instances are running in production, I would probably spin up just two of them. Yep. Or one, I don't know. Depends on the use case and depends on the app characteristics, right? Okay, <laughs> so the canary doesn't become the, uh, no. No, it's not. Sorry, I misunderstood. It doesn't. It doesn't become the, it gets deleted. But that version gets deployed as production. Yeah. I think the bigger question is around like auto scaling. If you had, you know, your normal instance was five, and like he said, there's tremendous pressure. You're at 20 now because you auto scaled up. Does it work in that situation? Will the canary now take on 20 because that's what it's currently sitting at because of the auto scaler, or what will happen? Uh, in the final, okay, that's, that's a good question actually, I've not thought about it, but if you look at the uh, final deploy to, product, uh, deploy to production stage right here, 
deploy to production, you can actually set some parameters here. Currently, it's just manifest based here, right? So I understand your question. If it has already scaled, will the production version have that uh, scale? Yeah, we had to do like custom you yeah. know, code for that to pull yeah. down the auto scale settings yeah. that are currently. As there. of now, I, I think it'll just uh, scale up to five or whatever the uh, thing was, yeah. Exactly. In this one, though, yeah. my fake pipeline had auto scale how you would use that within Spinnaker and then bind it to the app front. So we didn't do it in this one, though. Yeah, we are actually four minutes past 11.50. Uh, probably, yep, one more question. Yes, it does integrate with the Cloud Foundry service. Broker. So I think your question is, is, so one of the stages is deploy service, and what that does is effectively a CF create service of the service that you selected and the parameters that you set. So like I said, all of these stages are going under the covers to call, not CF, CLI, we're using the Cloud Foundry Java API to make calls, but they're the same REST calls, right? So. Any more questions? You want to go? <laughs> no? Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Appreciate you coming.